Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Burgoyne, and on behalf of the Bradford Hill Seminar Series Organising Committee, I would like to extend a warm welcome to today's Bradford Hill Seminar Series uh, seminar, which I'm delighted to say will be given by Professor Sir Michael Marmot. It's absolutely fantastic to see so many of you here, and we're expecting what we think is probably record seminar attendance today, uh, creeping up there towards 200 attendees, which is fantastic. Firstly, a bit about the series. Uh, the Bradford Hill Seminar Series is the principal joint seminar series of the Cambridge Population Health Sciences Partnership, which comprises the Departments of Public Health and Primary Care, the MRC Biostatistics Unit and the MRC Epidemiology Unit, all of the University of Cambridge. A special welcome to students on the MPhil in Population Health Sciences, which is jointly run by those three departments. Now, of course, Professor Marmot is a man who needs absolutely no introduction, but it is customary, so I'll be brief. Michael is Professor of Epidemiology at UCL and Director of the UCL Institute for Health Equity. He's held his professorship at UCL since 1985, but his work on health inequalities now spans almost 50 years. Among many career highlights, what stood out to me is his leadership of the Whitehall II study of British civil servants, which began in 1985. His publication of Fair Society, Healthy Lives at the request of the British government in 2010. And of course, his knighthood in 2000 for services to epidemiology and the understanding of health inequalities. Michael's talk today is titled Social Justice and Health Equity, and he's kindly agreed to take questions at the end. Because that might not be working for those who are using Teams on a web browser. So please enter your questions through the chat function and we'll do our best to summarise those and get through as many as possible towards the end of today's session. And with that, I'll hand over to Michael to start sharing his slides. Michael, uh, as soon as you're able to get your slides up there, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you can see my slides? Yes, we can. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Well, absolute pleasure to do this. And my theme is social justice and health equity. The opening line of my book, The Health Gap, was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick. With all the threats to the healthcare system from COVID and beyond, uh, we think a great deal about the NHS, rightly so. But my concern is with the conditions that make people sick, the social determinants of health. In my 2010 review, and again in my 2020 review, um, Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review, 10 years on, we had initially six domains of recommendations to improve health and reduce health inequalities. Give every child the best start in life, education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all. Everybody, and I'll come back to this, should have at least the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. Number four, healthy and number five, healthy and sustainable places and communities in which to live and work, including housing, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. And we've added to, particularly in the light of COVID, tackle discrimination, racism, and their outcomes. And this was in a way there all the way along. Um, pursue environmental sustainability and health equity together. So I published the 2010 review, drawing on the work I did leading the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We made these recommendations. And in our 2020 publication, we looked to see what had happened in the last 10 years and beyond. And the three themes I want to touch on today are dignity, freedom, and hope. Perhaps unusual for a biostatistics seminar to talk about dignity, freedom, and hope. But first, the bad news. We've had a decade plus of austerity. If you look at life expectancy for women and for men, taking this back to 1989, but I could take it back 
to 1920, and life expectancy was improving about one year every four years for women and for men. In 2010, there was a break in the curve, and the rate of improvement slowed dramatically. And then in 2020, uh, the first year of the pandemic, it fell. What happened in 2010? We had a new government elected, a conservative-led coalition government. They said to us, surely you can't be suggesting that it's anything we did that could have led to this slowdown. Well, we need to look at it. You had policies of austerity rolling back the state. And in fact, it's entirely possible that what you did led to this slowdown and to an increase in inequalities. These are regions, looking at women, the top set of graphs are the least deprived decile. So if you classify people by where they live, classify where they live by the index of multiple deprivation, then in the least deprived decile, the regional differences are quite small and life expectancy was improving a bit. If you're rich, it doesn't much matter where you live. Life expectancy is not bad. If you're poor, so this is the most deprived 10%, the lower set of curves, the regional differences are much bigger and growing, increasing. If you're poor, it matters a great deal where you live. Life expectancy was going up in London and going down for virtually every region outside London. So this is where we were pre-pandemic. Life expectancy had more or less stopped improving. The social, socioeconomic and regional inequalities were getting bigger and life expectancy for the poorest people was going down. Just think about that. The Im implied and in fact explicit promise post-war is things will get better all the time. And that should show up in better health. My general proposition is if society is improving, health is improving. If health's not improving, society's getting worse. If inequalities in health are getting bigger, inequalities in society are getting bigger. And life expectancy for the poorest people was going down over that decade from 2010. If we look at healthy life expectancy in 2000 and 2019, highly correlated, um, the UK doesn't look very good among other countries. And we're a bit below the line. In other words, the improvement that you would have expected was a bit less in the UK than in these other countries. There's Japan up there, long healthy life expectancy in 2000 and long in 2019. We look not very good at all. And in fact, our improvement was a bit less than the average. Thank goodness for the United States um, that looks worse than we do on just about every measure that I look at. Not everyone, but most. So the government that was elected in 2010 made no secret of their major ambition to roll back the state. And by golly, they did it. In 2009-10, public sector expenditure was 42% of GDP. Over the decade, that 42% became 35%. 7% of GDP, somebody can do the sums for me, but at today's figure, if GDP is about two and a half trillion pounds a year, taking 7% off is 175 billion. Reducing public sector expenditure by 175 billion pounds a year at today's figure, wow. And then in the first year of the pandemic, public sector expenditure went up. 
The Chancellor at the time, here's a trick question. Can you remember who the Chancellor was? Since the Brexit referendum in 2016, we've had seven chancellors, five prime ministers, seven secretaries of state for health. Uh, God knows how many housing ministers we've had. Complete chaos. But the secretary, the chancellor at the time, if I give you a clue, he's now the prime minister, said, whatever it takes. What? Whatever it takes. Back in 2009-10, there had been a global financial crisis and we were told we've got to cut expenditure. We'll be like Greece if we don't. In fact, Greece is doing quite well now. But we were told it was a moral necessity, an economic necessity to cut back on expenditure. Faced with a financial crisis related to the pandemic, the Chancellor said, whatever it takes, why didn't they say that back in 2009? Do you mean that was a political decision, not an economic necessity? And that political decision did great harm. In my 2010 report, we coined the phrase proportionate universalism. I was trying to combine two ideas, universalist approaches, common in Nordic countries, and targeted approaches, which are more common in the UK, means-tested benefits. You could call it levelling up. So here's the gradient, let's say, in life expectancy, less deprivation, longer life expectancy. If we target only the worst off, perhaps we'll improve their health. But what about the rest? the people who are above that threshold. So we said universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. What did we get post 2010? This is total local authority spending per person, the gray bars, by level of deprivation of the area. So for the least deprived 20% of areas, the spending per person over that decade from 2009-10 went down by 17%. The greater the deprivation, the greater the reduction in spending. In the most deprived quintile, it went down by 32%. What we've got here is effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Could that have played a role in the slowdown in health improvement, the increase in inequalities, the decline in life expectancy in the poorest areas? Yeah, I think it could. One of the architects of the of austerity, George Osborne, who was the chancellor in 2010, I heard him interviewed and he said, you know, you've got to you've got to live within your means as a country. The economic policies we pursued after 2010, this was this interview was just last year. The economic policies we pursued after 2010 meant we had the strongest growth in the G7. More jobs were created, a lot to be proud of. Britain in 2016 was buzzing. People looking at the UK and saying, that's the example we want to follow. I heard this and thought, where was I in 2016? That's not the Britain that I saw. What on earth is he talking about? This is UK real wages compared with peer countries. We're going up under Conservatives, went up quite a lot under Labour and went down. This is the change since 2009 in real wages and the peer countries. People were looking at Britain and saying, that's the example we want to follow. We'd like our people to be poorer. We wish we could do what the Brits were doing. What? What garbage? Absolute garbage. In science, what we do is tell the truth. 
if you don't tell the truth, how can you have a decent debate about what to do? Total government spending, percent of GDP. The global financial crisis in 2007-8 affected everybody. But this is what was going on. Total government spending, percent of GDP going up under Labour and down, as I've showed you, under the Conservatives. And these are the peer countries. We had a much bigger fall than other countries. Government spending on healthcare, it went up a bit under the Tories, went up a lot under Labour. And I'm not arguing from a party political viewpoint. I'm just looking at the evidence and then went down quite sharply under the Conservatives. The impact of benefit policy changes made between May 2010 and October 2023 by Vintile of equivalized household income after housing costs. This is the total change in percent. If you were in the second poorest, they didn't calculate it for the bottom for technical reasons. If you were in the second poorest, you got a dramatic fall in your income and a greater than about 25% drop. And then the richer you were, the less the reduction. There's pensions. Uh, they increased pensions for fairly obvious reasons. I sat with a former Conservative minister and I showed him a version of this graph. And I said, your government's policy was to make poor people poorer. And he looked a bit uncomfortable. And he said, well, perhaps it was not our explicit policy. They're very clever people in what was then Her Majesty's Treasury. They must have told the Chancellor that this was the effect of his policies. And he did it. He set out to make poor people poorer. And by golly, he succeeded. And thinking about this gradient, that the poorer you were, the less the reduction, and my whole approach to proportionate universalism, I said, let's think about the richest, not the poorest. So these are deciles of deprivation. Let's compare everybody with the least deprived decile and ask, how many excess deaths are there associated with having a level of deprivation below the very top? And obviously, the more deprived, the greater the excess deaths because of the gradient. Over the period from 2009 to 2020, there are 1 million excess deaths linked to having a level of deprivation below the top. And of those, 148,000 were in excess of what they would have been in the previous decade, linked to austerity. And in the first year of the pandemic, there were another 28,000. This is huge, and it means, yes, we've got to deal with poverty, but we've also got to deal with inequality, with the gradient. One million excess deaths, 148,000 of which could be attributed to austerity. Ah, but the government produced a levelling up white paper, brilliant white paper. Um, the problem is, the 2021 allocation of the levelling up fund was £32 per person in the north. And the drop in the annual council service spending over the previous decade was £413 per person per year. So we'll give you £32 and take away £413 and we call that levelling up. This is derisory. Eight councils from among the poorest fifth in England in the levelling up fund are set to receive less than £10 a head, while some areas within the most affluent fifth 
are set to receive many times that amount per head. Look at this. This is GDP per person. In the UK, if you took the richest region, London, out, GDP per person would go down by 14%. In Germany, if you take the richest region, Munich, Bavaria, out, makes negligible difference to GDP because the prosperity is spread around. In the Netherlands, if you take out the richest region, Amsterdam, it goes down by about 4%. In the US, again, the prosperity spread around, it goes down by about 2%. If you take London out of the UK in terms of income, the average for the rest in the UK is the same as Mississippi, the poorest US state. We are a poor country with one rich region, London. You get the same picture by looking at income. This is the 90th centile of household income adjusting for purchasing power. The red is the UK, the green is Norway, uh, the US and Switzerland. So in the 90th centile, the richest um, 10%, the 90th centile, the UK and Norway, pretty close. There's Slovenia down there, and we're a good deal poorer for our best off at the 90th centile, good deal poorer than the US and Switzerland. Now look at the median halfway point, the 50th centile. The UK is much poorer than Norway and Switzerland and the US. These are changes over time. Now look at the poorest 10%, the 10th centile. The UK is way below Norway. Norway's up at the Switzerland level. The UK is poorer than Slovenia. We are a rich country. We are, sorry, we are a poor country with a few rich people. That's why we've got to deal with the whole gradient, not just with poverty. Dignity. The Joseph Browntree Foundation did a survey of destitution. Destitution is doing without two or more of food, heating, clothing, toiletries, lighting, and shelter, sleeping rough. This is Britain in 2022. This is the percent of people who'd done without one of these in the preceding month. Food, we know there are high levels of food insecurity, heating. All in all, there were 3.8 million children, sorry, 3.8 million people who were in a state of destitution, 1 million children. And please don't listen when the prime minister or a minister says, we've taken people out of absolute poverty with great success. That 1 million children in a state of destitution in 2022 was a 2.9 fold increase over a, a five year period. The Joseph Rountree Foundation and the Trussell, Trussell Trust ca calculated the cost of meeting what they called essentials, the cost of basic essentials for single person and for couples. And this is universal credit. If you're on benefits, you get about 70% of what you need to buy essentials. We guarantee that if you're on benefits, you'll get sick because we won't give you enough to cover the cost of essentials. A few days ago, 
we launched a report um, on cold homes. There are three causes of fuel poverty. The quality of housing and we have the worst quality housing uh, in Europe. Poverty, and I've been talking about that, real wages of flatline since 2011, compared to rises in most OECD countries. And the cost of fuel, which is 30% higher in the UK than the European average. Look at this. If you're in the top 10% of income in France, you pay about 6.3%, 6% of household budget on energy at home. If you're in the top 10% in the UK, you spend about 6% on energy, same as in France. If you're in the bottom 10% in France, you spend 10% of household budget on energy. If you're in the bottom 10% in the UK, you spend nearly 18% on energy. That gap between the richest and the poorest in the percent of budget spent on energy is bigger in the UK than in any other European country. This is a very bad place to be poor, and it's not a very good place to be in the middle either. Not bad if you're at the top. Eat healthily. How many politicians have you heard say, oh, we could live on 30p a day, you know, poor people are lazy, they don't know how to cook, they're ignorant, they can't budget and so on and so forth. Look at this. If you're in the poorest 20% of household income, to follow the healthy eating guidance, the Eat Well Guide, you would have to spend 50% of household income on food. These people are not ignorant, they're not feckless, they're not lazy, they're poor. Don't blame poor people, blame their poverty. And work, of course, is supposed to be the way out of poverty. This is the proportion of people below the minimum income threshold, people in poverty, who are in working households, households where at least one adult is working. Two thirds of people in poverty are in working households. They're not shirkers. They're poor and lowly paid. So all of that is a threat to dignity. If you just can't afford to feed your children, if you can't afford to buy toothpaste, if you can't afford to heat your home, that's a real threat to dignity. What about freedom? And I don't mean libertarians. I mean, leading a life you have reason to value. Let's look at intergenerational equity. Change in child income poverty rates. Among 39 mainly rich countries, the UK had the biggest increase in child poverty between 2012 and 2019-21. The biggest increase in 39 countries. The Gallup organization asks people, do you think children today will have a better, worse, or roughly the same life as you? In the UK, 31% say a better life, 26% a worse life, and roughly the same. In other words, fewer than one third, and it's true in other European countries as well, fewer than one third of adults say that children will have a better life. Now think of the baby boomer generation. Their parents said our children will have a better life than we did. And by golly, they were right. Their children did. And in fact, the baby boomers' children I don't want to get my generations mixed up, but they were doing better. But now people's perception is that it's going to be worse for the next generation. And they're probably right. One way of measuring this is social mobility. How many generations at the current rate of social mobility would it take to 
go from being in the bottom 10% of income to being in the median. In Denmark, high levels of social mobility would take two generations. In Finland, Norway and Sweden it would take three generations. In the UK and the US, it would take five generations. In Brazil, nine. Why these big differences? Income inequality and spending on early childhood. We are heading in the direction of Brazil, not in the direction of Denmark, because we don't invest in the next generation, increased child poverty, lack of spending on early child development and education. And related to that, the share of 18 to 34 year olds living independently with their own children plummeted and living with their parents. Now, you might say, isn't that sweet, um, a 30 year old living with his or her parents? Um, isn't that sweet? But that may not be what they want. And the same has happened in the US. And it's because of what we're doing to the next generation. So when I talk about freedom, I quote Amartya Sen, we not only value living well and satisfactorily, but also appreciate having control over our lives. Sen's approach is having the freedom to lead a life you have reason to value. And that takes social action to create the conditions where people have the freedom to lead lives they have reason to value. Oh, this is all pretty grim. Where does hope come from? At the event on Monday evening in Parliament where we launched our latest Cold Homes report, a Labour MP from Liverpool said to me, don't for one moment have your head drop. You are being listened to all over. It may not, you may not be listened to in Westminster, but you are in cities all over the place. Marmot places, more than 40 local authorities have taken up the messages from my 2010 and 2020 reviews. Coventry was the first, declared itself a Marmot city. Greater Manchester, we did a report, um, Health Equity and Dignified Lives, Cheshire and Merseyside, and they're really active. They, as they call it implementing Marmot in Liverpool, Lancashire and Cumbria, Luton, London Borough, Waltham Forest, Gwent, the Southwest region, Leeds, all over the place. Here's Coventry, they have a Marmot partnership, integrated care systems, um, and they uh, have developed a plan to take what's now our eight principles, the two that we added, and get everybody working towards it. So they've got a, a Marmot steering group, city council, public health, education, libraries, adult learning, um, everybody, the police, fire and rescue, the voluntary and community sector are all involved in taking these recommendations and trying to improve lives in Coventry. And similarly in Liverpool, a great deal going on. What about healthcare? We've been working with integrated care systems in different parts of the country, and they are all trying to take the recommendations on social determinants of health and say, we as a health care system can do something about addressing these six or now eight domains. Business, legal and general approached me and said, not just can we legal and general do anything about improving health, but could business in general. And so, we produced a report, The Business of Health Equity, The Marmot Review for Industry. And we said there are three domains where business can get involved. Good quality work. Everybody should have at least a real living wage. 
benefits, conditions, and so on. Second, goods and services. Do you produce goods and services that are bad for health or good for health? And third, the wider impact on the community, the environment, and the like. The East London Foundation Trust picked it up and said, hey, we could do that. Uh, the East London Foundation Trust as a training and employment provider, and also they took on the principle of proportionate universalism, our service users, an impact on the wider community. And we've launched uh, 13 months ago, a health equity network. We launched it with eight people. It was 200, 400, now it's 1,680, I'm sure I'm out of date, uh, are members of this health equity network. And for what it's worth, uh, when Keir Starmer unveiled his health mission in a supporting document, they said the next Labour government will amplify the approach of Marmot cities like Greater Manchester and Coventry by making England a Marmot country, tackling the social inequalities that influence health. Yeah, I feel a bit hopeful. So let me finish quoting Raymond Williams. To be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was absolutely tremendous. Um, we've got some questions in the chat already, um, but I would encourage those who have got further queries to put them in there and uh, I'll try and sum them up and uh, put them to. But it will start with we'll start with the questions that have already come in, I think. Um, one that got a lot of uh, thumbs up, if you like. I just spilt a glass of water, but that's OK. Luckily, I have my computer perched up on an encyclopedia, so you. <laughs> the water didn't go on my laptop. Are, are you OK to continue or do you need to go and get a towel? Um, let me just. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, luckily, it was water and nothing else. Um, excuse me just one moment. Of course, of course. more time for uh, people to add questions in the chat. OK. Right. Perfect. So, Michael, I, I think a very popular question that came through, if I can just read this out, actually. Uh, firstly, it's from Lewis. It says, thank you for such an excellent and passionate presentation, and I'm sure that we'd all agree with that. In the world of ultra polarized politics and opinions, how do we bring politicians and others back towards understanding that proper investment in health and tackling its social determinants is not nanny statism, but crucial for truly leveling up the country. So that that was a very popular question, and I think it would be a good starting point. Well, I I've just um, I, I've just ordered a book that I saw referred to, which talked about the paradox of evidence. People like me think that. Uh, what we need is evidence to influence politicians and policymakers. The paradox of evidence is the evidence is that evidence doesn't change their minds. So the paradox of evidence is we ignore the evidence that evidence is insufficient. That said, that's what people like me know how to do um, is produce the evidence and convey it. Now, if um, the politicians really, really don't want to know, then uh, we can't change their minds simply with the evidence. But I'd like to think, and this is, um, as I said to you earlier, this was a private wish. I'd like to think that if we get enough local areas all committed to acting on this. I spoke to the local government association a couple of days ago, and they're a mix of conservative, Lib Dem, Labour, Greens, and whatever. And they're very enthusiastic because people at local government really understand this. 
So I'd like to think that if our democracy really was functioning, that you get enough local politicians and local leaders convinced by it. And I've had very little pushback at local level. People say, yep, they recognize this, that that will actually change the nature of the debate. Mm. And uh, I mean, uh, you know, I don't, I try not to be party political, but if you look at the level of dissatisfaction um, with government at the moment. Uh, I think it's in part because they've made a mess of the country and people recognise it. Thank you. That's a that's a that's a really interesting reflection. I mean, w what comes across in your talk is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, a, a sense of frustration at times with you know what is quite quite a despairing situation in a, in a lot of ways. I, I, I just wondered if you'd reflect for us a, a bit on your motivations and what it is that kind of keeps you going. I mean, is it promise of Marmot England and and more Marmot cities and uh, and that kind of thing? Or, you know, what is it that keeps you kind of pursuing and knocking on that door of, of change? Well, I think people asked me uh, not long ago, do I have a theory of change? And I said, yeah, a very sophisticated theory of change. I knock on a door and if it doesn't open, I don't bang my head against that door. I find a door that will open. Hmm. And we've got these 40 plus marmot places around the country. I've been approached by Scotland recently. We're talking with Scotland. I was, I gave a talk to, uh, was the first in-person meeting of Public Health Scotland since the pandemic. 750 public health people in Glasgow and the, the permanent secretary to the Scottish government mused publicly, perhaps Scotland should become a marmot country. Well, do I need to explain my motivation for keeping going? Um, yeah, it's frustrating that in central government, they don't want to listen, um, but they do want to listen all around the country, and they want to listen in other countries. Um, I won't bore you with explaining what my inbox looks like, but there's a great deal of interest in other countries. Uh, when I finish this, I'm talking to people in Toronto later today. Um, there's a huge amount of interest. So yeah, the motivation to keep going is that I feel people are listening in a way that they weren't I mean, I did an event on the weekend with some young doctors, uh, really committed young doctors who are working in Bangladesh and whatever. And one of them said to me, he asked me to explain the gradient, which I did. And he said, oh, I think that's starting to take off in understanding. I said, that's terrific. I published my first paper on the gradient in 1978. It's only 46 years for the idea to take off, if you're right. Well, OK, we have to wait a while, but we'll get there in the end. Brilliant. Fantastic stuff. Um, so one question that came through, I mean, clearly uh, your listeners uh, uh, here, as well as myself, you know, we such, saw such rapid change in life expectancy following changes in government. And you said it wasn't necessarily a party political issue. Um, but what is it do you think kind of that catalyzed such rapid change in life expectancy at that kind of change from Labour government to Conservative government in particular? It's a good question. Um, there is, uh, there, there have been analyses that show, uh, it, it's only a partial answer to your question, but they do show, uh, people in Liverpool did this, uh, they looked at the reduction in spend by local authorities, and it correlated with the lack of improvement. The deeper the cuts to local authority spending, the less the improvement in life expectancy. And I, I, it was in the graph that I showed you, but I didn't draw attention to it. The cuts in adult social care, um, 3% per person in the least deprived, 20%, 16 percent per person in the most deprived 20 percent. And we know that part of the contribution to the rapid slowdown was increased mortality in older people. And that might have been partly 
the lack of social care. Uh, it's miserable, the state of social care in the country, adult social care, really miserable. It's miserable for people who work in it, and it's miserable for the people who depend on it. And But storing up the problems for the future, uh, we know, and um, is the impact on children and how stressful it is to be a parent and not being able to feed your children and not being able to pay the rent. And we know that people who have multiple financial difficulties have increased risk of heart disease and mental illness. So it's not totally fanciful to say that these cuts in spending and the cost of living crisis uh, will lead to fairly acute effects as well as storing up problems for the longer term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, do you see an impending change of government, you know, and certainly an impending general election as cause for optimism then? Well, you know, I finished with hope. Um, I dug out a quote from Vaclav Havel. Do you remember he was the Czech dissident playwright um, who became the first president of Czechoslovakia after the fall of communism? And he said, hope is not a prognostication. It's not the same thing as optimism. It's doing the right thing because it's the, it's a, an orientation of the spirit. It's doing the right thing, regardless of the certainty of how it will come out. So when you ask me, do I see uh, if a change of government will lead to better? That's in a way asking, am I optimistic? I'm hopeful um, to take the Vaclav Havel formulation. I'm hopeful, but that doesn't mean, if I were just optimistic, I could, you know, play music or play with my grandchildren and do something different. But I'm hopeful, but that means that we've got to work at it and produce our reports and try and get them before government. Um, I've been doing a lot of public stuff lately, writing pieces, opinion pieces, going and doing interviews, and it helps change the climate a bit. So, mm. yeah, I'm hopeful that a government that actually is concerned with the health and well-being of the population might do things differently. But I'm not simply predicting it will. We've got to work to make that happen. Cool. OK, so we've got lots of questions coming in the chat now, and some of them are quite long. So I'm going to try and try to summarise. So Jonathan Stokes asks, how effective do you think Marmot cities can be if the level of funding stays the same as it is now? You know, is it the money that's vital or I guess is it just how the current money is spent? That is more and the important? answer is yes. It's both of those. It's both of those. In a way, it's a kind of experiment. It's not a proper controlled experiment. So we haven't got proper controls and I can't give you a pucker scientific answer to how well they work. I'd like to be able to, but I can't. Uh, but in Coventry, for example, which was the first Marmot City, we know that the percent of children age five with a good level of development went up. Mm -hmm. So I don't have the counterfactual. I can't tell you what would have happened if they weren't a Marmot City. I've already said it's not a, a pucker experiment. The percent of 18 to 24 year olds not in employment, education or training went down. Mm -hmm. The percent of people earning a real living wage went up. Hmm. So, yeah, they do need, it's much harder. I mean, Liverpool had a 42% reduction in spending per person. And we're, but they're really enthusiastic in Liverpool at trying to implement Marmot, to take my recommendations and do it. It would be much easier with a better funding settlement. Um, the much easier, it's much harder to do it within the funding envelope currently they have, but they're not sitting back saying, let's wait till we get more money. 
they're saying, right, let's use the resources and the people that we have to do the best we can right now. So, so it's a great response. It's a great response. Um, let me just move on to uh, the most recent question from Eva, who says, thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed the talk. How do we join uh, the Marmot Army, as she refers to it, and best conduct advocacy as doctors or health professionals? And it's a really good question about advocacy, actually, because you're a scientist, but also an advocate, and um, your reflections on that would be useful. Well, when I spent a year, firstly, as president of the British Medical Association, then a year as president of the World Medical Association, we produced reports on what doctors can do and what the medical profession could do. And we said five things education and training, so understanding social determinants of health. Second, which good doctors would do anyway, see the patient in broader perspective, so you don't just treat their blood pressure or their prediabetes, you understand the constraints on them. Um, third, we said the healthcare system as employer, I would now say as an anchor institution, so having the impact on the environment, procurement, employment um, practices and the like. Fourth, working in partnership. And so that relates to number two, seeing the patient in broader perspective, working in partnership with child health services, with the voluntary um, and care services uh, and the like, or with older people with social care. And the fifth is advocacy. Doctors are highly trusted, but rightly so, because we tell the truth and we're trusted to tell the truth. Uh, I mean, I was asked by a senior politician not long ago who said, we've got good ideas, but we don't get our ideas across to the public very well. What could you advise us? And I said, at this stage of my life, I know what I'm no good at. And I'm no good at telling politicians how to communicate. But I can tell you what I do. What I do is argue from the evidence. I tell the truth. Mm. And I engage people in a spirit of social justice. Um, I went to a health devolution committee meeting in Parliament a few weeks ago, and the co-chair said, hello, Michael, welcome. Are you going to be your usual disruptive self? And I said, I'm going to tell the truth. If that counts as being disruptive in this place, then, yeah, I'm going to be my usual disruptive self. So I think we need to argue from the evidence, we need to tell the truth, and we need to engage people in a spirit of social justice. Well, on that note, I think that is probably a good point to draw the lecture to a close. We do have many more questions, but I'm mindful of, of time. And that's uh, that was a great note to end on. So Michael, I'd just like to thank you once again for your time. Uh, it has provoked much discussion, I'm sure, and much deep thought, uh, many difficult kind of uh, issues to overcome. And um, many thanks to all those for joining today. And we hope to see you at a um, future Bradford Hill seminar series in due course. Thank you, everyone.